and welcome to Chats with Champions, um, a partnership between Skidolfo Library and Sherman's, second, uh, Sherman's Main Coast Bookshop. I almost said secondhand bookshop, but it's shop there when you can. <laughs> this morning, I think we have a special treat, but I thought she's been a treat for the last 20 plus years, haven't I? Uh, Katie came to Maine as a three and a half year old, started her traveling when she was three weeks old, probably saw more airports before she was one year old than you all have in your life. After attending Dara Scott of Montessori, where she distinguished herself in blocks and <laughs> theology, she's dying over here. Went on to Great Salt Bay, joined Mrs. Richardson Zoller as her teacher for a couple years, moved on to Lincoln Academy, and finally ended up with Smith. From there, and during that time, she traveled and traveled and traveled. It is my pleasure to introduce Katie K.J. Gormley, the digital nomad. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, yeah, so as um, Pam just said, my name is KJ Gormley, and I have been pretty much uh, on the road for the past four or so years. Whenever anyone asks me, where do you live? I say, well, I pay taxes in Maine, um, but I live out of a backpack most of the time. So this is just briefly uh, how life works when you live on the road and you travel a lot. And it's a little bit how my lifestyle works and a little bit some tips about travel in the 21st century because I will casually sit at a cafe with my mother in another country and book a hotel room on my phone and she will be flabbergasted. So uh, that's where we're going. So first up, um, what is a digital nomad? Digital nomads are a type of people who use telecommunications technologies to earn a living and more generally conduct their life in a, in a nomadic manner. As such workers often work remotely from foreign countries, coffee shops, public libraries, co-working spaces, or recreational vehicles. I have yet to work from an RV, but everything else there is me. Mm -hmm. um, but what does that mean for me? That means I sit around in a lot of cafes and drink a lot of coffee and use a lot of very subpar Wi-Fi to telecommute into my job, which is based in Portland. I work for a company called Library Thing, which means that the apple did not fall far from the tree. Um, and about six months into my job, my time at our headquarters in Portland, they said, you know, we're half remote. You don't, if you want to move outside of Portland, you can. I said, great. And then moved to New York. And then, then moved to Italy. Uh, illogical conclusion. So basically, I take my stuff with me wherever I go, and I work 40 hours a week. Um, five days a week I get vacation like everyone else and other than that it's kind of I fill in how I need to. Um, a lot of digital nomads will have more freelance contracts. A lot of digital nomads that I've met uh, will be bloggers or they will be photographers and they will make money that way or they will be copy editors and they will copy edit until they have enough money and then they'll move on. Um, so I decided to go traveling when I started paying rent in Brooklyn, which is an incredibly expensive place to live. So up here you can see roughly how traveling and living in Brooklyn are about the same amount of money, everything else um, in my budget usually goes to student loans because I'm a millennial. Um, so uh, to answer this, yes mom, I do actually have a budget. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Occasionally okay. she'll say, where are you getting this? I said, well I get paid. Um, so just really going to just talk about different aspects of travel and what they look like in the 21st century right now. Uh, so I got planes, which I will book almost entirely online, usually from my phone these days. I'll talk about resources when we get to the end of transportation. Um, I take everything from big inter intercontinental flights to flights out of the Amazon, which is on the left, uh, to other places in the Amazon because you can't travel. Uh, I actually avoid planes as much as possible. Um, I find them efficient, but they don't let you see any of the countries that you're going over, other than giant volcanoes like you can see right here. Uh, I take a lot of trains. Um, train travel is one of the great losses of America. We don't have enough of them. I want to take the Amtrak across the country, but other than that, there isn't casual train travel. And that makes me sad because Europe does it so well, um, and I got really into trains. Buses and automobiles come in all sorts of different flavors. Uh, this is a picture of taxis. I do not actually take a lot of taxis. 
I take a lot of Uber, which we'll talk about. Um, and then other. So everything from bikes in Germany to funiculars in Budapest to a horse in Patagonia to a ferry down the Amazon. Um, all of those things. Uh, so the way that I book tickets, which is usually pretty helpful information, I usually, I'm getting really lazy now and I only book on kayak.com. It's great. You, other, I used to, uh, when I, before I got a raise, used to compare four different places and pick whichever one had the cheapest, but now I can eat the 60 bucks. So there's Kayak, there's Momondo, there's Expedia, there's Google Flight. They're all going to give you basically the same flights. Um, I know when I travel in Europe, I like to travel one specific brand, so I'll do that, and I know to never take Ryanair ever. Um, and then with cars, um, I tend to only rent from the big international brands, mostly because I am still working on learning to drive stick, and they will always have an automatic for me to pay more for. Uh, in a lot of places, this is just a reminder, I don't know if everyone knows this, but you do need an international driving license if you want to drive abroad, except for the UK and Ireland where they don't care, which is weird because they're on the left and I really think you should know how to drive there. <laughs> Um, buses, trains, and taxis. Here are two places that are uh, two sites that are incredibly useful once you're on the ground. Um, Rome to Rio. You can put in two completely random small towns on different continents, and it will tell you what buses to take to get to the correct airport, the airplane to take, and what buses to take to get to the next place. And it will offer. It will say, "Did you want to take a train instead? Here's roughly what it will cost." So I use that a lot because I'm usually going from weird small town to weird small town. Uh, seat 61 is great for train travel, and it has sort of um, little blah-like entries about very specific train trips. So I'm going from Milan to Munich in a couple months, and there are about three different ways to do that. And I just picked the one with the prettiest um, alpine passes, and I use seat 61 to research that. Um, Uber and Lyft. Uber is more abroad. Again, they're just rideshare apps. You put in your address that you want to go to. It knows where you are because your phone knows where you are. And then you hit request and it's joined up to your credit card. And that is how I travel in most um, large cities if I'm not using the public transportation. Um, as a specific example, my mother and I took Uber all over Lima, Peru. And then after she left, I promptly started taking local taxis because they were cheaper. And then every country will probably have a specific app for it, but if you're in Europe, just use Uber. Uh, this is sort of how I plan what to do because I have this now, it's not a knack, it's a skill, I did develop it, to sort of, someone will say, we're going to go to Paris for a week, what should we do? And about 40 minutes later, I can just give them a day by day, oh, you may, you may want to check out this restaurant itinerary. And that's because I know how to research for a trip. So I start with daydreaming, which is mostly you know, seeing a cool thing online or just kind of vision board making um, and reading Lonely Planets. I read a lot of those. Brainstorming, which uh, I use the website Culture Trip all the time. They're newer, they're out of London, and they do a lot of like top 20 things to do in Berlin, top 20 things to do in Berlin if you're a millennial, top 20 places to eat if you're a millennial in Berlin in the fall. Like, it gets really granular. Uh, Again, Lonely Planets, the uh, Wonder Guides, and Eyewitness Guides are better for brainstorming than for research. But they're really pretty. And then I do research. So again, the Lonely Planet, which that gets down to, they will suggest itineraries, they will have, so you're in this random small town, here are the three hotels that will have rooms. Um, I do a lot of Google mapping to figure out distances between things, even just distance from bus station to a hostel to see if I might want to take a taxi when I'm there because I'm, if it's more than a half a mile, I'm not walking. Um, I also do a lot of research on weather, so half of my Google um, fill-ins are February weather and never we go, you know, <laughs> things like that. Um, and then after all of that information gets synthesized, usually in a very disorganized Google document, I write it down. I write down, because I tend to plan in terms of six-month trips or year-long trips, I'll write it down month by month and then week by week. And then day by day pretty much is when I get there and how I'm feeling. Because remember, I'm also working 40 hours a week. Um, a good sort of analysis of how I travel in terms of day to day is uh, people in New York would ask me, 
well, why don't you go to a museum every day when you travel? I say, well, why don't you go to a museum every day after work? You live in New York. Like, so some days I just kind of want to sit around and read a book. Um, and then I prioritize. So for every place that I go, I have my why I'm here, like what brought me to this place. Things I must do, things I want to try to do, things that maybe if I have the energy and they're nearby, I try to do. And then really, if there's time, such it's convenient. Um, so here we have tulips, because I was in Amsterdam in April. And April, right, not May? April. And then penguins in Patagonia, which was the entire point of going to Patagonia in the first place for me. So those are just outside of Punta Arenas. And then my final, well, another piece of advice is um, do what you like to do. I hate castles. I don't care. I have tried so many castles. You can't make me care about a castle. There's one castle somewhere with a left-handed staircase, and I'm going to go up it. But other than that, I just I don't care. On the other hand, I will hit up every medical oddity museum from here to Kingdom Come. So do the trip that you want. My mother and I tend to hit up libraries, because Busman's holidays, I guess. This is the Trinity Long Room in Dublin, by the way. Um, they also have the Book of Kells there, which was amazing. So your best trip isn't everyone's best trip, which means that when I read a, week's, a week in Blah Country or a week in Blah City, I just start crossing stuff off. Like, I don't care about visiting that monument, or I will visit that monument to take a picture of it and then walk right by. Um, or I will spend probably more time in a natural history museum than your average bear, unless it's a stuffed bear, in which case it's there forever. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at that. <laughs> um, and then another thing about travel is it's popular for a reason. Because I travel as sort of a constant tourist, um, the, there's a temptation to look for an authenticity, and I swear if I could get a PhD in something that really didn't matter, I would get it in constructed authenticity because Maine rocks that. We fake authenticity really well for tourists. It's wonderful. Sorry if you're from here, the lobster's still really good. Um, but go to the popular stuff. It's popular for a reason. David was transformative in my life. We all go to the lighthouse because it's really pretty. Um, and then know thyself. So this is the um, about knowing your energy. One of them, the one where it's my face, that is at the Blue Lagoon in Iceland, which is just a wonderful spa. And the other one was when I took a beach weekend in Colombia because I just needed to not have Wi-Fi and just to sit on a beach for a couple days. This is also where I tell you that it's okay to take a cruise. Um, my sister spends most of her days making decisions and being very responsible for things and just a lot of decision making. And the best vacation for her would probably be a cruise because she pays to then not have to make decisions for a week, which is a vacation. Um, it is, it's okay to take a cruise. I, I, but on the other hand, I think travel is a great way to expand your boundaries and to challenge yourself. Those would be the surfboards at my surf, first surfing lesson, which was um, a charming experience in three hours of humiliation, but for the three seconds that I was upright right before I ran over my surfing instructor, um, it was, Perfect. Uh, the one on the right is me in the rainforest. You can't tell from there exactly how sweaty I am, but it was a lot. Um, and then I do a lot of day trips, and I will actually just Google great day trips from X city, because I'm usually based in a city, because they have good Wi-Fi and cafes, because again, I'm working 40 hours a week. Um, and day trips are a great way to, if you are limited on time, and you would like to pay someone to take care of logistics, that's okay. Logistics are hard, and they're boring, and if you don't like solving public transportation puzzles like I do, just take a day trip. And whenever my, so my mother will join me in most places that I go, and we just take a lot of day trips with her. Um, sometimes I will need to save 50 bucks, and I'll take the train myself and I'll figure out how to do it, but day trips are pretty great. The example here, this is a Plitvica Lake Park in Croatia which is a giant limestone series of waterfalls and pools. And it was a nightmare to get to on public transportation, and I nearly had to stay the night in the middle of a forest. The day trip would have cost it 10 more dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and my last thing is, go to cultural events when you're there. Experience the cultural events. So left to right, bottom top, bottom top, is the Quebec Ice Festival. Um, uh, going to see a play at Shakespeare's Globe. 
a big Shakespeare person, uh, going to see a performance of the Vienna Philharmonic when I was in Vienna, and then a performance of my favorite Mahler symphony when I was in Budapest. So I try to research cultural offerings in a city where I am, and usually a guidebook will have a good um, way of telling you where to go looking for those offerings. I'll know your hand, sometimes at Shakespeare's Globe, you know where to look. Um, and then all of the plans that you make might be completely ruined, like this back of a receipt. So what happened here is I was in Croatia, I had a flight booked to Turkey, and then the United States government recommended that no non-essential military personnel or tourists should go to Turkey. So my father called me up and said, as a personal favor to me, could you not go to Turkey? <laughs> he said, just so I sleep for the next three weeks, could you not go to Turkey? So I ate the airfare, and then I went, well, where can I go that isn't in this one visa region that I've now expended all of my visa time in? And I looked at a map and I went, I guess I'm going to Eastern Europe? And scribbled it down scheduling-wise on the back of a napkin, or receipt, at a cafe. And that was the entirety of my plan. So I have these luscious Google documents filled with all sorts of helpful links and restaurants and I've made maps and there's wonderful and it's like embedded and then sometimes I write this stuff on the back of a receipt. And that's okay. I had a lot of fun in Eastern Europe. Um, then there's eating, which is really why I travel, quite honestly. Uh, my model in this is the late, great Anthony Bourdain. So these two quotes kind of sum it all up. Um, when I'm in a city that's new to me, I try to go to the central market very early in the trip. I'll go at 6 a.m. when people are shopping for businesses. You get to see what people buy and really eat. And then, without experimentation, a willingness to ask questions and try new things, we shall surely become static, repetitive, and moribund. I don't get up at 6 a.m. to go to markets. I think it's sweet when you're Anthony Bourdain, who's willing to get up and is getting paid to get up and go to markets. Um, but I do like to go visit markets, and I like to eat what the country eats. So, when in Rome, or Peru, or Chile, or Romania. These are all seafood. One, because seafood gets really weird. And two, because I eat a lot of seafood, because uh, I grew up around here. So, on the left, it's a piranha that I caught um, in the Amazon. Spoiler, they are really bad eating. But I ate it because it bit me, and now I'm one. <laughs> <laughs> On uh, the middle one are a bunch of crabs in the island of Chiloé in Chile. And the great thing about those is they would, you would point, the crab, point at the crab you wanted, they would take the crab, they'd smash it with a hammer, they'd shred it a little bit raw, put it in a little plastic cup, squeeze a lime over it, throw some onion on it, say, wait three minutes, and that was lunch. And I did that for a month, and it was amazing. And that is not where I got food poisoning. We will talk about that. Um, but on the other hand, that can kind of backfire. So on the right-hand side, we have um, what Romanians call crap fish, which is carp, but it's called crap in Romanian because it's crap. Um, I went on a, like, it was basically a swamp tour, I don't even know, and it was an airboat, and we pulled up at a dock, and by the time we got back to the dock, there was lunch, and they had yanked the carp out while we were on the boat, and they stuck it in a literal cauldron with a bunch of grass and garlic and just boiled it until it sort of was edible. And that was lunch. So it's sort of, I'm trying to show you, like, it's really cool when I ate wonderful crab and it was wonderful in Chile, and then sometimes there's crabfish. But it's worth trying the other ones. Um, how do I figure out where to eat? I really like TripAdvisor. I really like Yelp. I really like asking wherever my host recommends, because when I, we'll talk about this later, but when I'm staying in places, it's usually I'm renting a room in someone's apartment and they will usually have five or six pretty solid recommendations at a whole different, different levels of budget. And food markets. Food markets are great. They usually have prepared food. I think my favorite one thus far probably is in Barcelona because it's just this giant warehouse of culinary delights and you can just lose hours and euros and more hours and euros and so much, so much sardines. It's wonderful. Um, that's just a charcuterie plate in Croatia. And then the budget, the whole budget aspect, where I'm not made of money. Um, I cook a lot at home. 
Um, I put that in quotation marks so my family wouldn't laugh at me because I don't cook. Um, so I eat a lot of charcuterie when I'm, I'm gone. I eat a lot of just, that was just a plate full of figs that I had for dinner and they were great. Um, I think it was in Croatia and I had very little Croatian but I negotiated, I, you're supposed to haggle in Croatia. Um, that's another tip, know when you're supposed to haggle and if they're a haggling country, do it. It feels so horrible for Americans because we're like, but that's the price you named. That's not the price they want. They want 65% of that price or 75% of that price. So, and you're missing out on a cultural interaction by not haggling. So I haggled this lady down for like five pounds of dried figs for a couple bucks. It's great. And then there are cheat days. Um, I, you know, I grew up here. I like American food. I do not recommend eating um, hamburgers outside of the United States. Uh, they're just, they try. They, re they try really hard and it's really sweet, but they're not good. Um, but some days I just really want a Starbucks because it's comforting. Um, when my mom comes, visit, comes and visit me, she brings a can of corned beef hash because that is a sort of comforting staple I grew up on and she'll very lovingly make me a little bit of corned beef hash. We'll be in unbelievably beautiful locations with arguably great food cultures and I'm like, can we get to the hash? <laughs> um, and then where to sleep? Because this is the one that has really changed. Um, so I think about a comfort level. For me, I need a bed, a desk, and Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi and the bed are important. The desk is optimal. Um, me and my mom. We need two beds, one desk, Wi-Fi, air conditioning if it's a hot country, a bigger bathroom, maybe an elevator. You know what you need. Um, and also what your budget is. So way back at the beginning with my budget, I have about a running average of about $25 a night. That running average might go over six months. So it might be, I'm at $50 a night in Paris because that's the going rate in Paris, and then I'm going to go to a country where I know housing is cheaper for like $10 a night. I live in a lot of hostel dorms. But my mother and I, it's more like hotels. Um, and then I also have to pick the neighborhood. I'm not a fan of tourist neighborhoods if I'm going to be anywhere longer than a week. What tourist neighborhoods solve problems. They solve logistics and that's a really great thing about them and they're usually really close to the five big things you want to see. The food is never as good and you never get to meet anyone from the country. And sometimes that's okay. Sometimes that's fine. You wanted to go see the big art museum and that's why you're there. You're not there to get food and that's really fine. Um, I like to live easy access to tourist areas if I'm with my mom. If I'm not with my mom, I don't care. I will figure out the transportation. Uh, you can steal these. My actual search terms when I look for what neighborhood to live in is I look for a bohemian neighborhood or an artsy neighborhood or the gayborhood or hipsters or millennials. And what that means to me is that there will be enough cafes with Wi-Fi that I can do my job. Um, I can do my job from home, but it gets really boring to stay in an apartment all day. Um, another great thing about neighborhoods with those characteristics is the food is probably pretty good, um, but it's slightly more accessible for people who are not, uh, who don't know it very well. The dog is from one of uh, my wonderful Airbnbs that I stayed in. Um, and was, I guess, instead of a chocolate on a pillow, I got a dog on a pillow. <laughs> so here's where I talk about where I live and how I do this. So I live in other people's houses. Sounds kind of creepy, but there we go. I rent mostly off of Airbnb, and with Airbnb you can rent everything from an entire house to a whole apartment, to a room, to a shared room, to a bed, to, to sleeping on a couch. I choose a room of my own, usually a private bathroom if I can get it and swing it and it's in the right neighborhood. Um, I used to live mostly out of hostels. Other alternatives to sleeping in other people's places that are very easy to use is something called Inclusive, which started out as Noir BNB, which was addressing Airbnb's fairly endemic racism problem. Um, but Inclusive is more about uh, people who rent out are very open individuals. VRBO, I have no idea what that stands for, but it's how my mom and I got to stay on a houseboat in Amsterdam for a week. Homestay is where you, you are meaning to interact with your host family a lot more, and it's sort of a high, uh, friction environment with the local culture. 
And some days I want to do that, and some days I just kind of want to rent a room because I'm in the city because I need to kill time for a week. Um, hotels. I am a big fan of hotel tonight, but it's really risky. It's you can only get hotel for that night. However, sometimes it's a fourth the price. Um, Booking.com is where I have a membership. They are great for just the most obscure hotels. So if you're going to a weird, obscure place, I'd start with Booking.com. Hotwire is kind of a crapshoot, but it's a good crapshoot. It's how we wound up in like a five-star hotel in San Juan. Um, Expedia, so Expedia and Orbitz and all of those sites, they're all owned by Expedia. You're going to get the same results on Expedia and Orbitz. Um, and then one that my coworkers highly recommend that I just haven't gotten around to using a lot is Momondo. Um, other places, Hostel World, and I recommend this to everyone actually. Hostels are great, hostels are cheaper than hotels, and you can get private rooms in hostels. They are often very design trendy. They often will book day trips out of their front desk, and they're a great, if you were going to stay in a hotel, staying in a hostel private room will usually be about half what you were expecting to pay. The clientele is younger. I tend to avoid hostels that emphasize their party nature because that's not my nature at all. Um, but I do actually recommend everyone try a hostel at least once or twice. They, they are not, you know, bring your own sheets anymore. They're quite, quite swanky. Um, camping, I don't do a lot of it, but I'm going, going to do a lot of camping uh, next year when I'm in Africa because in a lot of places in Africa it's either luxury safaris or camp, and there's nothing really in the middle. Uh, and then I do a lot of overnight train trips, and I'll just get a sleeper ticket on a train and that covers both my transportation and a place to sleep for the night. Uh, packing, here we go. Home in a duffel, because we all have big houses, but I live out of a backpack. I do not actually live out of a backpack. I live out of a small backpack and a rolling suitcase because I don't want to carry my life because I'm pretty lazy. And I take a lot of public transportation where I can just shove the suitcase somewhere. So, what do I wear? This is, I'm going to move, I apologize to everyone who I said I wasn't going to move. This is what I wear most days, okay? It's a comfy cardigan. If I were really smart, it would be UV preventative, but it's not. Um, these are comfy pants. I'll talk about where I got them. They're kind of athleisure, which again I'll talk about, and uh, just a shirt. And I will bring not a lot of that, and I will wash it once a week, because laundry facilities exist everywhere. And especially um, the more sort of developing country you get, the cheaper laundry gets. And I just, I don't, I haven't done, every time I come back to Maine, I'm irked that I have to do my own laundry, because at that point I haven't done my laundry in six months, because I'll just drop it off somewhere. To, be, to have it done, because it's like three bucks. Um, so I take around, I'm gonna go back and forth to this slide. I take around what's called a capsule wardrobe, which is what I've committed to wearing for four to six to 12 months. Um, optimized, so everything goes together and can be repeated multiple times. This is not my capsule wardrobe. I took this from a wonderful site, which we'll talk about in a bit, um, but it's usually two pairs of pants and maybe three pairs of pants or a skirt couple dresses, some light shirts, some layering shirts, that's about it, and a jacket. And just everything goes with everything else, and I don't have to think about getting dressed at all. Um, and it just works. This also works, by the way, in real life. There are people who will make a capsule wardrobe out of their own closet and only wear that for a couple months here in the United States. Um, I wear sturdy fabrics. What that means is I'm usually dressing in what's called athleisure, which is athletic leisure, which really means I'm not being athletic in anything that I'm wearing, but it, and it is cut more like leisure clothing. So they're technical fabrics, like things that wick away sweat and odor and are slightly sturdier and stretchier, but meant for just kind of loafing around. Um, there's an adage in hiking and in travel that says cotton kills, because cotton will get wet and then it won't get dry and you will freeze, <coughs> unless it's really comfy. If you're not hiking and you're going to just kind of be around a city, where would you want? Bring jeans. This is my thing. Take cruises. Bring jeans. Go on day trips. It's fine. It's all fine. Um, when I'm making a wardrobe, I prioritize first clothes I can work in, then clothes I can loaf in. Those look similar, but I do have to change from sleep pajamas to work pajamas. Um, sleep clothes, hiking clothes, and swim clothes. 
Hiking clothes means I might take a pair of hiking boots and another technical fabric tank top, for example. And then weather appropriate. So this is the capsule wardrobe. This is weather appropriate. <laughs> Dress for the weather you're going to be in. This was in Scotland. It is a gorgeous hike. You know that rain we had yesterday? That was what I did the hike in. Um, but I was fine because I had my, I swear they're not paying me for this, the most perfect raincoat in the world, it's from L.L. Bean. It's great. It's what you get when you say, I'm going to Patagonia in Scotland and I'm going hiking. And then the very nice lady shows you over to this rack of um, non-Gore-Tex, Gore-Tex raincoats. And the only thing that got wet on that entire uh, like two-hour hike was the inside of my shoes because my pants got so waterlogged they dripped into the shoes. The shoes were on the outside were perfect. But dress for the weather that you're going to be in. Are you going to a rainy place? Bring a raincoat. Um, resources. These are very helpful. Um, I tend to actually dress mostly, mostly out of outdoor outfitters. They always, they will all have now a travel or yoga section, which is where the athleisure part comes in. El Bean has some good stuff. REI has some good stuff. The North Face has a really good line called Lucy, which is great if you're maybe more of a curvy person. And uh, Toad and Co. Um, athleisure clothing, like straight up from athleisure stores. Athleta is great. Most of my uh, more technical fabrics come from Athleta. Lululemon, if they made clothes in my size, I would wear them, but they don't. Champion, Target, Walmart. People will say, where do you buy your clothes? Honest to God, a lot of it's from Walmart. Um, travel lines and other stores. Travel Smith is great. It's just, uh, it skews a little bit um, older in style than I want to dress. And I am two tunics from Chico's Traveler away from being my godmother. Um, <laughs> shoes, I usually get from Ella Bean, Tevas, Chacos, Keens, Crocs, and Morel. And they all make um, sort of more street shoes rather than hiking boots. Not everything is a hiking boot every more, anymore. Um, if you want some good ideas, uh, there's this wonderful website called Travel Fashion Girl, which will run down an exhaustive list of 30 pairs of shoes that are out in April that are great for walking around cities in Europe in the summer. Like, it gets really specific. I also find inspiration on Instagram, mostly because that's, those are all the ads I get on Instagram. I just realized not everyone here has an Instagram. Okay, maybe Facebook. Um, and then other travelers, travelers, I will go, where'd you get those pants? Oh, okay, Token Co. I've never been there. So that's travel wardrobe. Staying cute and unburnt. Um, all of your favorite things come in travel size. If they don't, they make little tubes you can squeeze them in. Um, I have ridiculous hair needs because curls are hard. And I found them in travel size and they come with me. And I'm a minimalist traveler, but I have four products for my hair, which I think is reasonable. Um, <laughs> It's also okay to want to look nice when you travel, especially if you're going to take as many selfies as I do. Um, solid versus liquid makeup, do I look like I know? I do not. Uh, other travelers seem to recommend solid makeup, but if you use a liquid makeup and it's your thing, just go for it. Um, I, don't, I don't understand hair dryers. I'm sure if you want a hair dryer, they come and travel. I just thought I had to talk about it a little bit. I've never used a hair dryer in my life. Um, but take sunscreen. Everybody needs sunscreen. Everybody needs more sunscreen than they're using. It comes in cute travel sizes. You can try out new types with travel sizes. You can try out the expensive sunscreen in travel sizes. La Roche-Posé is great, but illegal in Hawaii, which means I think we're all supposed to switch. Anyway, sunscreen. Wear sunscreen. This is my, my lecture. And this is what I bring to work. This is the entirety of my office. It fits in a tiny little tote bag. Um, that is my laptop, a notebook so I can write things down to remember to do them, a pen, a cell phone, headphones, and a USB stick. I almost left the USB stick out because I haven't used it in multiple years. That's it. That's my office. I can work from a bed. I can work from a park bench. I can work from a dock. I have done all of these things. I can work from the part of a boat, which was an interesting experience. Um, entertainment. It looks, that is a picture of a book. I like to read books from authors in that country in translation while I'm there. I think it's kind of fun. Gabriel Garcia Marquez probably had some short stories I wanted to start with, but I started with, you know, 100 Years of Solitude. And then I wrote a notebook to write in. Um, I mostly just have a Kindle. Uh, the Kindle solved library problems for me and toting around lots of books. 
Um, but sometimes you want a physical copy, and searching out English language bookstores in foreign countries is always really fascinating, and you can find and meet really cool people that way. And of course, the important stuff, wallet keys, passport, visa. This is where I tell you that I have an international immigration record in the United Kingdom, and I once spent an entire day being forcibly detained in Heathrow for visa issues. This is my please check the visa requirements of where you're going. Um, talk. Just don't be me. And I mean, it was a very entertaining jaunt through bureaucracy. They gave me a lot of tea. They found me sandwiches. They woke my mother up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and then my mother woke the Boston UK consulate up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And then I think my father tried to wake up Olympia Snow at 3 o'clock in the morning. Angus um, King. Angus King, yeah. Um, uh, so look ahead. Figure out your visas. Americans have an incredible, incredibly powerful passport. It's not the most powerful passport, but it's in the top three. What that means is we mostly don't need visas, or we can get visas on the ground when you go places. If you're doing something like volunteering somewhere, that gets hairy. I will just say that. That's how I wound up not having a work visa to volunteer to mine sheep in Northern Ireland. Anyway. Wallet keys, passport. Uh, passports are important. Please your New Yorks. I like to collect stamps. Sometimes countries will have extra stamps at tourist places, so I have a Machu Picchu stamp in one of mine. Um, yeah. Sort of, not quite last but last least, but this is the question that always comes up, mostly from adults who have kids, who try to, I think, then imagine their children doing what I do and just fuzz out. Safety. Um, these are what, this is what my dad thinks is scary. I can have the slide because he's not here today. Um, that's skydiving and emergency situations and hospitals and random animals that are going to come and kill me in my tent in the night. This is what's actually scary. On the left is a very happy, completely unprepared hiker. Um, I was very warm at the bottom, so I left my jacket. It was about 33 degrees at the top. I'm grimacing because it's freezing up there. I was not good at hiking, I was just enthusiastic. So unpreparedness is actually not a safety thing. Um, the middle bit, which I will talk about in a little bit more detail, but um, I find a lot of aspects of political situations are a lot um, more of a threat than perhaps you might think they are, and they're coming from different places. And then the last one is a thing of oysters, which I do recommend eating abroad if you like oysters, but you are taking your life in your own hands when you eat seafood abroad, because, especially raw, because it's cooked less. So the political situation in countries. I find it's good to do a general sort of BBC News search on a country before I go. Um, and then I try to make reasoned ideas about political situations. So when the BBC says, oh my god, there are so many people with guns in this country, why would anyone go there? They're talking about New York City. Right? So my litmus test on safety is different as an American than if I were French. Um, I like to be aware of what the sort of political undercurrents in the country we are. The left-hand side um, is sorry, political undercurrents and to also understand what a protest might be where I am because I've run across a lot of them because we were in a little bit of a tumultuous time in case anyone's noticed. Um, on the left is an example, it's a flyer for a protest that was done in early 2007. I ended up attending, it was a great, great time um, for you many Americans. On the right, it looks like there's blood everywhere, but this is the um, proof of the colorful revolution in Macedonia that is, current, that is still ongoing, which is because of construction corruption reasons and a lack of uh, it, no, nobody wanting to restart an actual violent war. Um, the protests in Skopje, Macedonia are conducted entirely by a paint bomb and paint gun. Um, which was very interesting because you go down the downtown of, er, of, this, of this capital city and all of these marble edifices, which are completely fake and were erected and where um, the construction to make them was very corrupt and that's where all of the helpful money from the EU went have all been covered in paint. All of the lions have red eyes that cry. It's very unsettling, and it's good to know what you're doing. So I went back to my hostel and said, 
why is the downtown covered in paint? But I think it's good to have a sort of an idea of the political situation before you go. A more benign example might be uh, the Paris that I went to four years ago is not the Paris my friend went to this year. Um, Paris had a terrorist attack. All of the cops have guns now. My UK friends are horrified by that. And I went, your cops didn't have guns ahead of time? So it's, a, again, a very, like, your assessment of safety is very different. Language barrier. Languages are great. I love learning languages. Languages are also hard and they provide problems, and sometimes that's a safety issue. Sometimes it's just fun. On the left, that's a train ticket. I don't know where it's going. Um, I had no idea where, where it was going when I got it. it. I hope it was the place that it was pronounced. I got to where I needed to go. Um, on the left is, or on the right, is just a sign in uh, Irish Gaelic. Um, so I, I don't find languages to be a safety issue. I find them interesting, and I think only going to English-speaking countries really limits you. And I think, um, yeah. So here are the phrases that I learned. I, the ones on the left are the ones that I will definitely learn by the time I step down, and the ones on the right I will learn in the process of living in that country. So, good morning, hello, please, thank you, excuse me, pardon, and then the most important sentence, sorry, I don't speak, blah. Do you speak, and then you list the language that you speak in the order of your competency. Um, I also really like the, I want that. That is a great sentence. And the politest way you can say it, so I would like this, please. This, that, more or less, help. And then transportation, I am from, I do this, and then any important medical or allergy words. So, for example, I learned how to say, I'm allergic to penicillin in every language that I go to. I have no idea the sentence structure. I'm sure it's awful. It comes from Google. But I learned to say no penicillin, because that's, a deep, that's an allergy that I have. Language resources. Google Translate is great. Um, this is, I went to two different restaurants. And you can see what I translated from the menu. Um, Google Translate, can, you can point it at a menu if you, have, if you have data, and it will live translate the menu for you. It's amazing. It looks like a magic trick to anyone who hasn't seen it before. Um, you can download your language ahead of time if you're not going to have data. Um, my friend recommends Ultralingua, which is a better about uh, specific contexts. And then if you want to learn languages, which I highly recommend, uh, Duolingo or Mango Languages. Here we go. Um, this is about being yourself abroad and the different facets of who you are, because you bring yourself abroad. You bring all of your baggage with you. I know you bring your physical baggage. You bring a whole lot of baggage that maybe you didn't ask for as certain aspects of you. And you definitely bring all the emotional baggage you were leaving. You thought you were leaving in the airport. It's coming with you. You might find it over a very nice dinner, but it's with you. So Americans abroad, a great quote by my friend Mark Twain. The gentle reader will never, never know what a consummate ass he can become until he goes abroad. Um, Mark Twain actually wrote that because he, the innocent abroad, because he incurred so much debt in America that he had to flee the country. Fun fact. Um, so I have now traveled abroad under three presidents. I have traveled abroad under George Bush, under President Obama, and our current president. And I have received radically different receptions as an American traveling under each of those. Under George Bush, uh, we were blatantly recommended to pretend that we were Canadian if we thought we could carry it off. Um, I did. Maine is very close to Canada. Under President Obama, people were generally favorable. Um, and, oh, isn't it cool that you did this? Yes, it is cool. Yes, we're very proud. Under our current president, um, it's interesting because I thought I would need to go back to the whole George Bush mechanism, which is you pretend you're not American. But when you leave the country, there is um, there was a certain amount of horrified pity that I got. It wasn't, we hate you. And I went to Latin America, where they totally could have been just ragging on me. It was sort of, oh, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, I will say this, no matter your political affiliation here, if you have a passport and you leave the country, everyone assumes you voted for a Democrat. That is just what everyone assumes. Um, so I find it really okay to be an American abroad. I find it an opportunity to present a perhaps more, perhaps more nuanced representation of Americans than what the worldwide media is pre presents as us, and I find that mostly by being a polite guest in everyone's country. 
Um, this is about being a woman abroad. There are dress codes. This is me ready for Easter service. Can anyone tell me what is wrong with this? Your shoulders. My shoulders were uncovered and I got some very nasty looks. It's a cute outfit, but I got looks. Um, another big thing is taxi safety. Um, and that's really more by feel and your own feelings of risk. I will never take my mother into a local taxi if I can get out of it, or one that isn't leaving directly from a accredited organization within an airport. Uh, we will take Uber, because my mother is an older woman and she looks like a walking money bag when we're together. I, however, look like, sorry, sorry, it's true. I, however, look like the scuzzy backpacker that I am, and I will mostly take taxis. However, if I get a weird feeling about a taxi, or if it's kind of a weirder taxi, I will take a picture of it and I will send it to my sister or my parents. Um, but I'm still going to take a taxi, you still going to live in the world. Um, I didn't learn any of these skills by traveling, I learned them by living in New York City. Uh, just sort of general safety, you know how to be safe as a woman. It's not really safe, but the same practices that work here work elsewhere. Um, I know you said I can only use one square, can I use one more square? One more. Okay. There's this concept called RBF, otherwise known as resting bitch face. And it is the most useful thing I have ever learned. And is you just look like the most unpleasant person that no one ever wants to sit next to. And that solves most issues. Um, and then there's the last thing which really irks me, and I get a lot as a woman. It's couched in a lot of different ways, but it's the who do you belong to chat. And it's, oh, are you married? Oh, do you have a boyfriend? Why don't you have a boyfriend? Would you like a Colombian boyfriend? Blah, 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 blah. I did that in so many circumstances, and I've done it in so many countries. And that's the chat, and I haven't figured out how to shut it down yet, or politely get out of the situation. But just be aware that that is a chat. I'm considering borrowing a ring to pretend like I'm married. It's probably more important for me to do that than some of the grayer hairs in the room. Just, I'm young and everyone wants to know. Uh, the last thing is being gay or queer abroad. This is a map. The greener it is, the better it is, the redder it is, the worse it is. There are 72 countries on the planet where homosexuality is in some level illegal um, or penalized criminally. Um, there are a lot of really interesting countries with fascinating animals in them and really cool places. I still go. Um, but it's a really important thing to be aware of. A lot of travelers aren't aware of it. If you're straight, you've probably never had to think about it. But you see those really, really dark countries in red? That is what homosexuality, which I am, I'm bisexual, um, and I read as kind of gay a lot. Um, that is where homosexuality is punishable by death, and I will not go to those countries. Or if I have to go to those countries, I'm not leaving the airport. Um, so it's consideration when you're traveling is, you know, maybe other people in your life couldn't go here. I meet a lot of travelers who are all like, yeah, let's go to Nigeria. And I have to say, let's not go to Nigeria. I can't go there. Maybe you have Jewish friends, maybe you are Jewish. There's a whole swath of countries that you can't go to. You take all of your identities with you when you travel, not just the ones that you choose to present. In the countries where I'm going, where homosexuality is illegal, I lie. I am very closeted. It's frustrating because I have been out of the closet since I was 15. But I lie. My ex-girlfriend's name is not what it is. I make up another name. I just, I lie. And it is, it is a, um, a smaller sacrifice to go do the thing that is important to me. So it's a bit more nuanced because I'm not just not going to go to any country in here that's even mildly red or orange. But yeah, so it is a sacrifice. Or uh, Russia is really interesting because it's a lighter orange, but I won't go there um, because I just if you're a Western country and you don't like gay people, like that's a little bit more of an ethical thing for me. Um, just pity I really want to go to St. Petersburg. Uh, sort of general advice about personal well-being: the travel insurance that I use is the gold standard, and it is World Nomads. Thank you for the Christmas present, my parents. Um, it's great, I have like $300,000 to get out of a country if a war breaks out. Um, they will fly someone in to come stay with me if I get sick, things like that. I get a lot of vaccines, I'm actually going to leave here and go get the last round of a rabies vaccine. 
Um, they are great. Maine has several travel clinics. I really like the one at Martins Point in Portland, but you can pick the one you want. Don't skimp out on vaccines. Just don't. Um, I hope I don't have to tell everyone to vaccinate their children or their grandchildren. That seems uh, useful. Mosquito repellent will do so much. Ella Bean sells some other brand that is a cream one, so it's really easy to take when you're traveling. Um, I used it every day in the Amazon and walked through clouds of mosquitoes and didn't get bitten. Again, the sunscreen, put in your sunscreen. And knowing your limits, know when you get tired, know what you can't do, and be okay with that. You can't do it, that's fine. Know where maybe you want to try a little harder. Um, and maybe figure out ways that you can make a thing that might be harder at one level be easier at another. The best example of this is um, Machu Picchu. Sorry, Mom, I keep on using this. I'm careful. So for Machu Picchu, we took the train there. It was lovely. And then you could take the bus up and you could go on a group tour. We paid the extra money to hire a private guide so that when walking around on Machu Picchu, we could take as much time as we wanted and we could spend an hour going up the stairs that take other people 20 minutes. And it was okay. And that's really okay to do. And it's really fine to just figure out if you want to do something, it seems callous, if you want to do something, there is a way that you can throw enough money at it that it'll happen. Um, stuff will be. I have slept cuddling a laptop a lot. If I lose my laptop my entire life, because again, I work 40 hours a week, if I lose a laptop, my entire life becomes a ground getting another laptop. That is, all plans go away. Um, if I, there's an actual HR policy, working mostly for me, um, if I lose internet where I am for more than three days, I have to go find internet. I hit two and a half days on a beach in Albania, because that was a real tough couple days, um, when someone drove over the cord that connected the entire bottom half of Albania to the internet. Um, I highly recommend a crossbody bag. I never recommend carrying an open tote bag. They're cute. I own a lot of tote bags. Um, but crossbody bags are great. They go across your body. If it makes you feel better to get a travel safe or an RFID cloning, anti, whatever bag, that's great. I haven't used them. They seem fine. Um, and then I have a lock. A lock. I use a lot more than you think it, I do. One with a little bendable handle is usually more helpful. And then coming home. Take pictures. <laughs> you can have a theme. My theme seems to be pointing my phone at my feet and take your picture. But it's actually a nice way to snapshot stuff, plus I see a lot of great tile work. Um, that is Lymington, Maine, Sofia, Bulgaria on the top right, Valparaiso on the bottom left, and Tangier, Morocco on the bottom right. Um, you can take pictures of you. A great way to actually make travel friends is to ask people to take pictures of you, and everyone gets it. We live in a very highly photographic world. I highly recommend finding the artsiest looking 20-something or teenager that you can find in the surrounding radius and asking them to take a picture, because they will take eight pictures from multiple angles and they will all be great. <laughs> I, Sorry guys, I don't actually like asking people with gray hair to take my picture. <laughs> it is a little bit prejudiced, but they never come out well, and I have to explain how to use my phone every time. Um, on the left is the basalt columns in Iceland. In the middle is in Maine, um, just as it get an action shot. There it's me eating, shockingly. And uh, on the right is in front of the Berlin Wall. And I just found a group of artsy Japanese teenagers and said, can you do this? And usually if you waggle a phone at someone or a camera, they'll get it. Um, for souvenirs, I am the least spontaneous souvenir buyer ever. I research what can I only get in this country. I rarely ever buy keychains. Um, and then I have to figure out how will I get it back. Like, can I foist a duffel bag off on someone who's coming to visit me and pay for it to go through check luggage? That's one way. Um, you can mail it back, you can bring it back in your suitcase, you can pack a half empty suitcase, which I recommend. Um, I usually write a list because I am that person. And I love to send postcards, and people love to get postcards. We only get like bills and sad things in the mail anymore. Postcards are great. Um, re entering the United States. I, if you travel more abroad more than once every two years, I highly recommend applying for global entry. It lets you skip about two hours of lines whenever you re-enter the United States in most eastern seaboard airports. 
Uh, because of the aforementioned, aforementioned immigration issue in the UK, I'm not eligible, so everyone else should get it because I can't. Um, remember things you can't bring in, which are most fun food things. You can't bring in cheese from Europe, you can't bring in meats from Europe, you can't bring in good food from Europe. I've had cheese confiscated before and I haven't quite gotten over it. And then think it's a kind of a good time to remember that our border is really different for different people who wander through it. Um, I was giving a travel recommendation to my boss and her wife who were taking their child abroad. And I said, oh, do you have this form that proves you're not kidnapping your own child because you're a gay couple? And she said, oh, no, I, I don't need that form. I said, no, you really do need that form. The further you are from a retired couple or a family, a white family of four visiting Disney World, the less privilege you have, and the harder it is to go through any border and travel. And I think it's just kind of it, while you're standing in these forever lines, or not the forever line if you get global entry, it's kind of a good time to think on that, just a little bit. Uh, quick questions. I'm going to preempt a couple questions that I get a lot, or my mother gets a lot on my behalf. What do you do if it epically goes wrong? Um, historically, sit on my suitcase and cry, and then figure out what I'm doing. So. The best example of this was, uh, it was now a funny story about, uh, in Romania, I was uh, needed to get from one town in Romania to a town in Bulgaria to the south. And a popular beach resort town in between the two of them in Romania has a very similar name. So I confidently worked my way and I asked locals and I had my Romanian that I've been working on and I asked and I got to this perfect beach resort town of like 300 people in the off season, 70 miles north of where I needed to be, on a day and a time where there were no buses going there. And literally no one had any idea that this had happened because I said, I'm going to Bulgaria, I'll write you tonight. Literally no one on the planet knew where I was. Um, so I sat in the dusty road and I cried. And then I went, okay, the only person who can fix this right now is me. And then I did a very American thing, which is I used money to fix my problems. And I'm really telling you that's okay. I went up to the nearest big town, and in French, a language I do not speak, but I speak better than Romanian, um, I managed to, through hand gestures, book a taxi to drive me across a border and to get to my next destination. It cost me $200. And it was probably one of the best $200 I have ever spent. So what do you do when it goes wrong? Cry, then fix it. Because you're the only one who can fix it. Unless you're my travel insurance company, in which case I pay you to fix a lot of my problems. Um, what is my favorite place I've gone? Wherever I am. But in particular, I would go back to and highly recommend visiting Ireland. I really loved Croatia. I really loved the southern part of Albania, which means that really I would like Greece, because it's the same thing. Um, I loved Peru. I would move to Peru if I could. Machu Picchu was utterly worth the money. Um, I really liked one island in Chile, which was really cool. It really was Chile's main, which is probably why I really liked it. Um, and I loved Iceland. I wish I could afford Iceland again. It's a great trip. It's incredibly expensive. And number three, do you get lonely? I get this question a lot because I do this by myself. And there are more women traveling alone than you think there are. I meet all of them all the time. Um, I don't really get lonely. If I want people, I live in a hostel as opposed to an Airbnb. I've gotten, a, made an art of making a two-day friend. Because, oh, we're both here, and we're both here in the city for two days. Let's go see the sites together. Um, I work, again, 40 hours a week with a remote team. So I'm talking to people that I know and have known all day. I Skype with my family. Um, there are two times when I felt desperately, desperately lonely. And one of them was right after the Pulse shooting in 2016, which was a shooting in a gay nightclub. And no one where I was knew that I was gay, and I didn't feel comfortable coming out. And I had no community and no way to fully explain my community grief to anyone that I was with, and that was a very isolating experience. The other time is when I got food poisoning. I wish to say I could got food poisoning off of something fascinating food. 
Like, I ate a really cool oyster, or I tried this really weird thing, or I ate raw meat, or I ate this, that, the other thing. No, I ate a cheeseburger, and the lettuce was contaminated, and I got food poisoning for a week in the desert at 7,000 feet, and it was horrible. Um, I lived off of Gatorade and the compassion of like this grandmother who kept going, aren't you going to go to the clinic, dear? And I kept saying, my doctor said to wait three days. Um, and that was just profoundly lonely because it's no fun to be sick when you're a rod. However, I got better. I mean, that was when my mother decided to book a plane flight to meet me in Machu Picchu, but really I got sick when I was abroad and I had a baby. So uh, those are really the only times when I get sick and when something happens and I have no one to really process it with. And that's basically my talk. I will now open up for your questions if you want.